Dunkirk in the summer of 1940, the war really starts for the British people. As the British Expeditionary Force returns to England, it leaves all its equipment behind. In this time of common danger, under fire from German guns across the channel, under constant bombardment from enemy planes, the British people achieve a unity unknown in days of peace. Every man not in essential work takes his place in the armed forces. Men over age train after work in civil defense units. In the wartime parliament, a government is formed from all parties. Labor leaders like Herbert Morrison and Ernest Bevan enter the war cabinet. Trade union representatives are appointed to many government boards and committees. The nation puts forth its maximum effort. Women are drafted into the factories. Even women over 40 work part-time alongside men past the retiring age and boys just fresh from school. To meet the needs of war production, they choose not the slave labor of the Axis countries, but the democratic way of joint responsibility and joint participation. The attack on Russia and the entry of Russia into the war as an ally strengthens their determination. The Russians stand firm against the Nazi invaders. The Soviet workers speed the making of munitions to defend their country. As they do so, the workers of Britain get a reassurance of victory, the knowledge of a solid front against the Axis. To mobilize the complete resources of the nation, they realize they must extend democracy to the factories, use the brains of the workers as well as their strength. For they believe that democracy is the most efficient system, the only answer to total war. In this spirit, they organize labor management or joint production committees to discuss such matters as general production efficiency, safety, absenteeism, and transport conditions. By joint consultation between management and workers, these committees develop the combined initiative of every section of industry. Sir Stafford Cripps, Minister of Aircraft Production, says of them, This truly democratic partnership in our industries has brought the great fund of knowledge amongst the workers to bear on the problems of production. It's helped us to reach and maintain in our factories the vast output necessary in wartime. It's the first time that workers have been consulted upon matters which were once considered the care of management alone. It's the first time, too, that there has been a recognized agreement between workers and management by which the cooperation of the elected representatives of the workers is given in production matters. These committees are a step towards a new industrial democracy in the making. As they have been of value to increase and maintain production in time of war, so they will equally have to be used in times of peace, if the well-being and standards of our people are to be maintained. Even before the war started, forms of joint production committees had been in existence. For instance, this factory, typical of many in the engineering industry, had a works council, which later turned into a production committee following the agreement of the trade unions and the employers' federation. Before the war, this factory made high-powered automobiles. Now it makes gun carriages, header tanks for Spitfires, and engine accessories for all kinds of aircraft. It's a fairly large factory with several shops and departments, and each department elects a subcommittee of its own. These departmental committees are in effect miniature labor management committees. On them, two or three representatives elected by the workers in the shop, with the shop steward, meet nominees of the management, usually including the foreman. Departmental committees are re-elected at regular intervals, and the method of election is typical of elections of labor management committees in factories. First of all come nominations, and nomination forms are distributed by the personnel office and the to those workers who want to put forward candidates for election. No one may stand for election unless he or she is properly nominated and has the necessary qualifications. A certain length of service in the factory, age over 21, and trade union membership. 
women are equally eligible with men. The candidates in this shop are Sam Gordon, engine fitter, Bunny Dias, riveter, Ted Ennis, aircraft fitter, and Bill Wadham, aircraft fitter. Election is by secret ballot, and everyone in the factory over 18 may vote. A sealed ballot box is placed in the shop, and on payday, each worker gets one voting paper in his pay packet, and one only. Two or three days are allowed for voting, and then the votes are counted. As in all democratic elections, both sides are represented at the counting. At this election, by the management secretary and the worker secretary and the factory labor management committee. The elected representatives of the workers with those appointed by management meet in committee once a week. Their job is to deal with matters which arise in their own department. Sometimes a problem affects two departments, and often this can be settled by a meeting of the two chairmen. If a point comes up which the departmental committee can't settle, they refer it to the main labor management committee of the factory. The main committee again consists of representatives appointed by the management, including the general manager and works manager, and representatives of the workers chosen by vote of the whole factory. If a piece of business calls for technical information, an employee with special knowledge may be co-opted. Well, what's it all about, Jack? It's these pressings. These are from one supplier whom we've been seeing for about 12 months. They're okay. These are from another supplier made to the same drawing and should be identical, but they're not interchangeable. You see, the profiles are different. And it's been reported to the committee because it dislocated production for a day or two. Well, what, what have we done about it? Uh, are we still held up? No, we withdrew the presents and altered them. It is fairly obvious that the new firm got a ministry of concession to depart from the drawings to suit their own plant. Yes, that frequently happens. Unfortunately, though, the concession they obtained was not notified to all manufacturers, and so the drawings weren't altered. Well, the men in the shop think that this is quite an important matter. For all that may happen in some other factory. That's right, yes. Why don't we send a letter to the regional board and make sure it doesn't happen again? I second that. Agreed. 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 Um, would you please see that a letter is written to the regional board and emphasize that we're not complaining because we were held up ourselves, but make the point that the granting of concessions or the altering of drawings without everybody interested being notified might easily cause a hold up in any factory, whatever contract they're on. The regional boards of the Ministry of Production, to which committees can refer matters they can't settle themselves, continue the principle of joint consultation. The chairman is the regional controller of the Ministry of Production, and the board includes representatives of the supply departments. In addition, there are equal numbers of members representing employers and trade unions in the area. Above the regional boards is the National Production Advisory Council, meeting in London under the chairmanship of the Minister of Production, Mr. Oliver Littleton. The council directs and coordinates production throughout the country. And again, both sides of industry take part in its discussions. The National Production Advisory Council is in a way the highest expression of the Joint Production Committee idea. I preside over it as Minister of Production. With the help of my ministerial colleagues from the Ministry of Labor, the Admiralty, the Ministry of Supply and the Ministry of Aircraft Production. The members of the council consist of the leaders of the employers' associations and the trade unions, and of a representative, again drawn from one or other side of industry, from each of the 11 regional production boards of Great Britain. We hold meetings at regular intervals. We exchange views on general production questions, including matters suggested by particular regional boards. By this means, there is an open channel through me to the War Cabinet itself. The Council has always taken a special interest in the Joint Production Committee movement. There are now over 4,000 of these committees in the engineering and allied industries alone. Ever rises steadily. Their usefulness is undoubted and their work has been most valuable. They have sprung spontaneously from the efforts of employers and employed. The government warmly welcomes their advent and encourages their utmost practicable extension.
basic industry in Britain is coal. On coal, all other industries depend. The mills and factories, the gas works and power stations, the railways, which are the backbone of the country's transport system, all draw their power from coal. In the coal mines, faced with the task of providing more coal than ever with fewer men, labor management committees have introduced a new element of stability. Minister of Fuel and Power, responsible for the efficiency of coal production, is Major Gwilym Lloyd George. I personally regard these committees as one of the most important measures taken to ensure the well-being of the industry. They give the two sides of the industry a great opportunity uh, to work out a new and better relationship and uh, to turn their attention to positive and constructive issues. Changing conditions in the mines continually raise questions of adjustment, often involving deep human problems. This pit committee, for instance, is faced with a situation in which about a hundred men will be thrown out of work because of an intrusion which will cut off one of the faces. We could find room for these men if I can persuade you to give up your old custom of each man having six yards of face. Suppose, for example, each man had four and a half yards of face. You could then place one extra man in every three. And if we undercut the coal to a proportionately greater depth, we could ensure that each man had the same tonnage to fill. I know that this is a new departure, but I should like to hear what you think about it, and I hope you'll give it a favorable reception. Mr. Chairman, you're asking us to forego an old custom. Actually, it's a signed agreement between management and men. Secondly, Surely the alteration in the method of cutting is going to entail more work for everyone on the coal face. Oh, I don't think so. I do not agree, Mr. Chairman, with your proposals, because ever since you've been at the quarry, you have been trying to break down this custom, and we have been able to resist it so far. Is that your view, then? Definitely. And yours? Yes. It looks as if we've reached a deadlock. Yes. The only thing we can do now is refer the matter to the regional controller. Are you agreed that we do that? Well, Mr. Secretary, you might write a letter to the regional controller, point out the position that we fail to agree, that we should like his assistance speedily. You might add that the main obstacle is the men's adherence to custom. They do raise subsidiary objections, such as possibility of additional timbering, possibility of the conveyors not being adequate, but the main thing is custom. The regional controller of the Ministry of Fuel and Power discusses the letter with the regional labor director, a trade union official released by his union for the duration, who is responsible to the regional controller for all labor matters in the area. They decide to attend the next meeting of the pit committee. At this meeting, it is the turn of one of the miners to act as chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've had an opportunity of considering your letter and the minutes of the last meeting of your committee with the regional labor director. And we are very glad to have this opportunity of taking counsel with you and your colleagues. The regional labor director will outline his proposals to you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Controller, and gentlemen, there are two ways of dealing with the movement of the 98 men affected by this closure. The first is by transferring them to other pits in the district at distances from here varying from 8 to 25 miles and involving a fair amount of transport. If this is done, I estimate the daily output of coal that they would give at the pits to which they're transferred as 315 tons. The second proposal involves the acceptance by the workmen of the placing of these men at this colliery. And I hope the committee will feel in a position to recommend the workmen 
to accept them on their existing faces. If this is done, I estimate that we shall be able to receive from these men the daily rate of production, a daily output of 450 tons. 315 tons if we transfer them to other collieries, 450 tons per day if we can retain them at this colliery. In this way, we should also be able to obviate the hardship of transfer and transport. Gentlemen, we don't want to be unhelpful, but we must satisfy our men, and we shall require further information on this matter. Yes, there's a question of conveying. Will the manager indicate how he proposes conveying the additional 450 tons? The stopping of this face would make it possible to transfer good equipment onto the two faces where the men will have to work. Furthermore, we can speed the belts up 50% if necessary, and I have no doubt that we shall be well able to deal with the extra output. I beg to differ. Even with our present load, last week we had two breakdowns, and I suggest that something's got to be done about these conveyors, otherwise I can see no point in sending additional men on these faces. Oh, certainly. And if we found the conveyor was not adequate, we should obtain a larger one. Will the controller give us the assurance that the custom that is in operation at the present time will be restored to us immediately it becomes practicable? Yes, just as I am entitled to ask that no custom should be allowed to interfere with output in wartime, so I think equally you are entitled to ask that if a custom is abrogated during wartime, that it shall be restored to you when the emergency is over. And I have the assurance of the colliery agent also uh, that he will support the restoration of the custom. Mr. Chairman, Having heard the replies to the questions put, and knowing that an emergency exists, also having the assurance of the controller that the custom will be restored, I'm prepared to recommend that the men accept the proposed alterations. I agree. Yeah. Yes. I think it's a right decision. Well, gentlemen, we are prepared to recommend acceptance. And we'll be glad if the Labour Director will come and state the case to the men, the same as he has stated his case this afternoon. I will, Mr. Chairman. On the day of the meeting, the miners gather in the Trade Union Hall to hear the Regional Labour Director explain his point of view. May I point out, gentlemen, one thing in this connection of some historical value. We stood together in the days of the slump in this township. There were then too many men at the colliery. And there was a proposal at that particular time to dis dismiss men from the pit. We discussed that question in this branch room and we decided upon the principle of work sharing until more prosperous times came along. None of us have need to regret the stand and the decision that we took on that occasion. We're called upon to face a similar issue today. I'd like to give this meeting this assurance that when the manpower of the nation is, su is sufficiently secure to enable development work to be undertaken at this colliery, such development work shall be undertaken and that the men who are now being taken by you on other faces shall be allowed to go into this new work. I'm certain, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen, that the committee is infallibly right in making this recommendation. I'm certain that it's in the best interest of the men at this colliery in the best interests of the industry generally, and certainly in the best interests of the nation. I hope you'll accept the Pit Production Committee's recommendation. Mr. Chairman, I strongly object to that, because I'm convinced on this, if ever we accept this, we shall never get this custom back again. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, 
as a worker not affected by this transference, I'm going to move the acceptance of the report. I realize I must work harder in the future. But think of the horrible alternative. The social life of this village will collapse. Through times of stress and strain we have built up in this village, marvelous social organizations amongst ourselves. The libraries, but the educational and recreational facilities, our medical aid and hospital services will all suffer as a consequence of this. And we've put too much into it to let these things go down. But, and remember this, this must be taken as no indication of weakness. We demand the right that when this reef pace returns to normality, that we shall again return to the previous conditions. I have much pleasure, Mr. Chairman, in moving the acceptance of the report. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Now, gentlemen, after having heard the report of the Regional Director of Labour and the motion so ably moved by Lou Jones, I'm now going to submit the motion. All in favour of the motion, please show. There is no need to count. That has been unanimously carried. Well, that's champion, Bob. We shall be able to keep the men here and we shall get the call. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Another problem has been solved by joint consultation, a problem which might have led to reduced production and affected the lives of many miners and their families. Instead, no miners will have to be transferred and output will be maintained. All over the country, similar committees are meeting. In the factories, morale is high because the workers know that the efficient running of the plant is up to them as well as to management. In the government-owned Royal Ordnance Factories, first body to sign a national agreement for labor management committees with the trade unions, committees meet regularly. Superintendent and managers, shop stewards and workmen pool their knowledge and ideas to secure maximum production efficiency to make sure that the output of finished guns and parts keeps pace with the constant stream of raw materials reaching the plant. Dozens of airfields are being built, and on them, with their special short-term problems, labor management committees find plenty to do. Particularly important is their task of establishing a real partnership between the men who build the airfields and the airmen who use them. And so they invite airmen to visit the sites, to tell how they are holding up their end of the job, and to present trophies to the gangs who are doing the best work. In many factories, there are special publicity subcommittees of the Labor Management Committee. They are entrusted with the vital task of keeping the workers informed of the purpose of the jobs they do. Posters and charts serve to keep everyone in touch with production progress so that each man knows if the plant is maintaining schedule. Exhibitions show them what happens to the various parts they make. For it is the democratic belief that free people work best when they understand the meaning of the things they do. In the factories, the more each worker understands the function of his job, the better his work becomes. The committees use wall newspapers to broadcast production details. They mark up target figures on notice boards. They display the minutes of their meetings in the shops and encourage senior workers to spread information around the factory by word of mouth. Jobs are no longer meaningless. Work acquires a new purpose and interest. In this spirit of understanding and responsibility, workers' representatives speak to their fellow workers throughout the factory. The men of our fighting services and our great allies have done and are doing a magnificent job. The men and women of this factory by their work and effort over a long period, have played a vital part in recent victories. We, and the millions of workers in other factories, know that we can supply the weapons 
to bring this war to a speedy end. We all want to see this grim business over. We all have a part to play. Recent successes are only steps on the road to final victory. We are pledged to the invasion of the continent, to stamp out forever the horrors of Nazism and fascism. This will mean sacrifices, but any sacrifices we make are small compared to those made by the Russians and our lads on the fighting fronts. And it's up to us to smash all records. Salute to the men who smashed the Axis in Africa and are smashing it in Europe. Salute too to the millions of men and women, workers and managers alike, who are cooperating to ensure that the men who are smashing the Axis shall have the weapons to do it. For in Britain and in Canada and the United States too, labor management committees are using the democratic method of joint consultation to keep the efficiency of war production at its peak. From their joint effort comes a great flood of munitions of war, of all the products needed by the fighting forces and by the people on the home front. From their cooperation, from their sense of joint responsibility, comes a new democratic partnership in production, providing the weapons of victory and laying a sure foundation for social progress after the war.